Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rates here on Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. And today from the United Nations, um, there is, is a couple of really, really important things. Uh, the Secretary General welcomes the adoption by the General Assembly to its historic resolution recognizing the right to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment. He says it's a landmark demonstration for member states um, to collectively fight against the triple planetary crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. Uh, In today's press briefing, they're also going to talk about um, the Ukraine and updates on what's going on with Ukraine uh, and the in Yemen what's going on there Central Africa Republic and some personnel changes as well as they are going to talk um, about the UN Security Council ruling on um, Libya and the and the UN mission in Libya what the the decision uh, that the uh, UN Security Council came up with actually means to ongoing efforts also we, we're going to hear from uh, the ambassador uh, to the UN from Israel as he talks about um, the problems that are happening in that region and he is very critical of the UN Security Council and that it's saying that it's not recognizing the true problem of terrorism and th- how the Palestinian hatred is affecting the area. So uh, l- let's listen to today's segments and hear what they actually said. Well, keep in mind that, um, especially uh, between Palestine and Israel, hatred goes both ways. And um, this year there was a Palestinian uh, journalist who was shot by an Israeli sniper. And there's still ongoing investigation about that also. Hatred does go both ways in in that region and peace in that region would be a wonderful thing where both sides can live commonly together. In a short while, I will be joined here by Martin Griffiths, uh, the Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, I believe he will be coming to speak to us by VTC link in a short while. This morning, we issued a statement in which the Secretary General welcomes the adoption by the General Assembly of his historic resolution recognizing the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. He says that this landmark development demonstrates that member states can come together in our collective fight against the triple planetary crises of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. The Secretary General says that the international community has given universal recognition to this right and brought us closer to making it a reality for all. 
He notes that the resolution will help reduce environmental injustices, close protection gaps, and empower people, especially those that are in vulnerable situations, including environmental human rights defenders, children, youth, women, and indigenous people. The Secretary General added that the resolution will also help states accelerate the implementation of their environmental and human rights obligations and commitments. However, he stresses, the adoption of the resolution is only the beginning. He urges states to make the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment a reality for everyone, everywhere. And Michelle Bachelet has also issued a statement on this. In a statement we issued last night, the Secretary General warmly welcomed the official inauguration of the Joint Coordination Center in Istanbul earlier in the day. He underscores the importance of the parties working in partnership directly to effectively implement the Black Sea Grain Initiative with a view to reducing global food insecurity. The work of the JCC will enable the safe transportation by merchant ships of grain and related foodstuffs and fertilizers from three key Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea to the rest of the world. This will help to effectively respond to and prevent rising global food insecurity. Together with the implementation of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Russian Federation and the Secretariat of the United Nations on promoting the access of Russian food products to, and fertilizers to world markets, it will help reinstate confidence in the global food market and reduce food prices from their current levels. Uh, further on Ukraine, our humanitarian colleagues in the country are sounding the alarm about a new wave of shelling and airstrikes having a high impact on civilians across most of the country. Over the last 24 hours, at least 10 of the country's 24 oblasts have experienced attacks, including intense fighting reported in the Donbass region, according to our partners on the ground and local authorities. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that in Donetsk oblast, strikes and fighting have reportedly left many people killed or injured over the last 24 hours on both sides of the front line. Yesterday, for example, a hotel was hit and completely destroyed in Bakhmut, in the government-controlled areas of the oblast, leaving an unconfirmed number of people injured and at least one dead. The situation is also critical in the southern Mikulaevska oblast, where civilians have endured daily shelling and airstrikes for more than a week. According to humanitarian security reports, Mikulaevska oblast has been impacted by attacks at least 184 times in July alone, which, besides damaging and destroying infrastructure, have killed over 20 civilians and injured more than 80 others. In Luhansk Oblast, although fighting has reduced since the Russian Federation forces and affiliated groups took control of most of the region, the humanitarian situation is reportedly increasingly critical. The UN and its humanitarian partners have not had access to the region since early June, but reports we have received from local authorities say that access to water and sanitation services, as well as much-needed health care, is extremely limited. Across Ukraine, we, along with our humanitarian partners, have provided critical assistance to more than 11 million people. However, insecurity and impediments imposed by the parties to the conflict are hampering operations and impacting our ability to provide life-saving assistance to those who are most impacted by the war. And we have two new resident coordinators to announce today following approval by the respective host governments. The Development Coordination Office says that in Ukraine, Denise Brown of Canada will take up her post as resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator on the 30th of July. In Kyrgyzstan, Anje Graue of Germany will lead our UN team on the ground starting the 31st of July. And you can find the full biographies of our newly appointed co colleagues online. This morning, the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed departed for Bridgetown, Barbados at the invitation of the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Mormatli, who is chair of the Development Committee and a Sustainable Development Goals Advocate. They will co-host a high-level retreat on the global financial architecture for a world facing global shocks. The meeting will seek to have an informal dialogue on taking stock of the international financial systems, examining ways it needs to shift to serve the world we live in today, including opportunities for immediate action and longer-term cha changes uh, to expand resource availability to enable countries to meet the SDGs, including the climate commitments. The Deputy Secretary General will return to New York on Monday. Turning to Yemen, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that torrential rains and heavy flooding have hit several areas across Yemen over the last two weeks, causing extensive damage to public infrastructure, shelters for displaced people, and other private property. Across the country, approximately 86,000 people have been affected, 
including more than 10,000 families in Marib who had already been displaced by the war. Humanitarian agencies are providing the worst affected families with emergency food, hygiene kits, and other supplies. So far, nearly 8,000 people have received assistance, and additional shelter support has also been provided to more than 1,600 families. Flooding in Yemen is a seasonal threat. Unfortunately, many of the sectors in the humanitarian response plan that address floods are drastically underfunded. For example, the shelter response has received only 18% of its requirements so far. We urge all donors to increase support for the Yemen Humanitarian Response Plan. We have an update from the Central African Republic where our peacekeeping mission continues to help build national capacity to protect civilians and promote security. Training on the Central African Model Community Policing is currently underway in Bangui with support from the mission and the UN Development Program. 27 heads of units of the, inter of the internal security forces, including five women, are participating in this training aimed at bringing the country's security forces and the local population to work closer together to build trust and improve security. The training is expected to be rolled out in other cities, including Bambari, Bangasu, Berberati, Buar, and Sibut. Meanwhile, peacekeepers report that they have increased their presence and patrolling, including by carrying out more than 1,200 patrols this week throughout the country. In the east, protection efforts by peacekeepers to secure Bakuma, Berau, Bria, Inzaku, Wajajale, and Rafai are helping to improve the security situation and the resumption of economic activities there. And I have a senior personnel appointment announcement. Today, the Secretary General is appointing Abdu Abari of Niger as a special representative for Central Africa and head of the UN Regional Office for Central Africa, or UNOCA. Mr. Abari succeeds Francois Lansani Fall of Guinea to whom the Secretary General is grateful for his dedication and excellent leadership of UNOCA over the past five and a half years. Mr. Abari brings extensive experience in the areas of politics and diplomacy. He's currently serving as permanent representative of Niger to the United Nations in New York, and you will find lots more in his career in a bio being shared with you now. Uh, we have an update now from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. With the situation remains tense and fragile as protesters continue to target UN peacekeeping bases, although to a lesser degree than in previous days. We acknowledge the efforts of political and community actors to restore calm by urging people to refrain from violence against the mission. Particularly in Goma, Nyamalima, and Rwindi, the increased presence of national security forces near our compounds has helped to deter violence directed at UN personnel and bases. MONUSCO stands ready to work with the Congolese authorities to investigate incidents in which demonstrators lost their lives or were injured. The mission is also continuing its work with the authorities and people of the DRC to protect civilians, deter armed groups, and build the capacity of state institutions and services. Today, MONUSCO remains on high alert and continues to work closely with local security forces and to engage with national authorities, civil society, and community groups to restore confidence and calm. At a camp in Uvira, protesters briefly breached the perimeter and damaged some vehicles. In Beni, protesters threw petrol bombs at our Bokene base, while an attempt to breach our Madaba compound was blocked. In a concerning development in Butembu, in North Kivu, it has been reported that Mai Mai combatants have joined protesters to reinforce the demonstrations. Threats against the mission are also continuing to circulate on social media. And last, today is World Hepatitis Day theme is bringing hepatitis care closer to you. The World Health Organization notes that most acute hepatitis infections cause mild disease and even go undetected. But in some cases, they can lead to complications and can be fatal. In 2019 alone, an estimated 78,000 deaths occurred worldwide due to complications from acute hepatitis A to E infections. And that's it for me. Uh, we'll go to our guest in a bit. But before that, uh, yes, Edie. Um. Uh, uh, just a quick follow-up on what you just said about Congo. Um, can we infer from this that that protesters are still out in some locations from what you just said about Butembo, for example? Yes, and, and of course the worry for us is not so, even so much the protesters, it's the fact that armed groups like the Mai Mai are, are themselves uh, uh, being seen uh, present in, at these occasions. Um, my question is, does the Secretary General have any comment on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's uh, threat 
to use nuclear weapons in potential confrontations with the United States and South Korea, a threat he yeah. made yesterday. Yes, uh, we're against all rhetoric uh, involving the use of such uh, deadly weapons. And of course, we continue to call for resumed negotiations on the peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, yes, James. Uh, this afternoon, the Security Council is to vote on um, the UNSMIL um, um, mandate. Um, but again, it's going to be a technical rollover of three months because no agreement could be found on a longer um, uh, timeline for the mission. What is the Secretary General's view on this, given that, you know, this is one of the most important missions uh, that, 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 that exists. It's, um, it still remains a very delicate time for Libya. Does, does there need to be more continuity and certainty for UNSMIL? We certainly would appreciate greater continuity and greater certainty for our mission in Libya. Uh, obviously, we will accept uh, whatever length of uh, the extension of mandate is given to us by the Security Council. But we have been making it clear uh, to the Security Council the need uh, for the mission uh, to be able to provide uh, uh, stability uh, to the people of Libya. And that, of course, en entails uh, the ability of the people of Libya to rely on the continued work but by the mission itself. As you're aware, the the, the sticking point is the same as it's been before. A permanent member of the Council um, wants the Secretary General to come up with a name to head UNSMIL before it will agree to a longer um, time frame for, for the renewal. Where is the Secretary General on his discussions about the new head of, of, of UNSMIL? My understanding is that the Algerian candidate who he had been proposing has been blocked. Uh, the discussions we have uh, on this appointment are ongoing, and we hope that we can uh, get someone appointed. Ob obviously, if the Security Council believes it is important to have that appointment, we want the, the members of the Council to be able to work productively with us so that we can get someone appointed as soon as possible. Not another question, but ahead of Martin Griffiths' um, uh, briefing to us, he briefed the member states, as you said yes, he would. He, he, uh, he's but, here. but, but, but it was not listed here. on the Malu listings, on the UN Journal, or on UN TV's listings. We were all trying to find it, and then it popped up on Web TV. Can you please ask people to be a little bit more, you know, make sure oh. things are, are all listed publicly for us? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I hadn't. I hadn't been Thank aware you. that he hadn't been in the listings. Uh, he is, by the way. Uh, he, he's. Uh, I was mistaken about him being here by v VTC. He's in the back room right now. So, whenever you're done with me, I will. We'll I will look bring him. To speak to so it's so so we now know where he is. Yes, Joe. Yes, thank you. Um, the Secretary General, on a number of occasions, has expressed uh, his keen disappointment with um, the Taliban's record when it comes to uh, violating basic human rights of women and girls uh, in Afghanistan. Um, yet yesterday, the uh, UNESCO passed a one-sided resolution naming only Israel, out of all the country member states, as uh, a country violating the uh, human rights of, of women. Um, no mention of, of um, Afghanistan, Iran, or anything else. So in light of the Secretary General's comments about, and I'm focusing on Afghanistan and the condition of women and girls there, uh, does he have any comment on the exclusion of Afghanistan at minimum from the resolution that only targeted Israel. Thank you. Well, uh, as, as you know, this is a resolution that was voted on by member states, and this was a decision taken by member states, not by the UN Secretariat or by UNESCO. Uh, so, uh, so we leave that matter in, in their particular hands, but at the same time, we want to make absolutely clear that, uh, that the sort of actions being taken by the de facto authorities in Afghanistan have been very damaging to women's rights. You, you'll have seen uh, the briefing uh, that our colleague from UN Women uh, gave on this on Monday uh, to you. And, and we stand again with our concerns about uh, what we feel has been a dangerous backsliding 
from uh, the previous protections that had been uh, uh, enshrined for women's rights in Afghanistan. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I said UNESCO, I, I correct myself, it's uh, actually ECOSOC. Um, so oh, sorry. Th 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 that's one of the main so, organs of the, of the UN. Uh, again, but, to correct but, the record. Uh, but again, it's, it's ECOSOC. Uh, but what I, I know the answer about the member states, it's up to them. But doesn't the Secretary General have a view, specifically at, at the using the use of uh, one of the main organs of the UN to single out only Israel, and uh, when it comes to women's rights violations, not include? Afghanistan, not include Iran, uh, etc. I mean, doesn't he have a view on that? Uh, the views, the views that we have on uh, places of concern are, are views that we've expressed, and and it's we've clearly expressed our views concerning the situation in Afghanistan, regarding uh, uh, votes by bodies of member states. Th those votes uh, are taken by the individual member states and. Uh, we respect uh, their right to vote as, as they will. Yes. Thanks, Farhan. Um, a group of uh, U.S. Uh, Congress members uh, wrote a letter to the SG and asked um, UN um, to hold Taliban accountable for attacks on human rights in Afghan um, women and girls. Um, can you confirm if the SG received the letter and what he um, what is his response to that? Uh, well, I will first uh, check to see whether the letter has been formally received. Um, uh, so I, I will check on that and get back to you on that. What I can say, of course, uh, as, as I said to Joe, is uh, that uh, we continue to have and continue to express with the de facto authorities in Afghanistan our concerns uh, to make sure that they abide, as they said they would, by their previously stated commitments uh, to, uh, to uphold basic rights, including the rights of women and girls. We've seen disturbing signs uh, and, and have reported on this repeatedly that that is not being done, and we continue to raise this issue with them. Um, another follow-up. In this letter, um, the Congress uh, members point out about um, uh, the UN make sure that the Taliban don't get a seat in the United Nations, and it's, I know that the um, UN Credential Committee is holding a meeting on, in September. Is there an, any ongoing discussion about what is going to happen to Afghanistan's seat in the United Nations? Uh, well, th those are, uh, as you pointed out, issues that are taken up by the Credentials Committee, which is a member state body. Uh, ultimately, uh, at this stage, there's been no change in the status quo concerning the representation of, uh, of Afghanistan at the United Nations. Uh, any such change would have to uh, entail a change uh, first by that Credentials Committee. One more question. Um, one part of a letter uh, points out that the um, help that the UN um, sends to Afghanistan, it's distributing among people when women are not present at the um, at the scene or women don't get as much as help and they say they I code that they say it's um, the UN reports from UNAMAS it's just disturbing that the women are not uh, participating as much what is your point of view on that well this is something we've been taking uh, up with the authorities and we are trying to make sure that that there will be no policies in place that are discriminatory against the women of Afghanistan. And uh, we will continue uh, to push for that in our discussions. Uh, and with that, uh, yes, uh, Ibrahim, and then we'll go to our guest. Tunisia's new constitution and the referendum um, that was held <coughs> recently, um, fears are being raised in human rights circles and in... Um, some governments as well, that this new constitution um, could weaken Tunisia's democracy and erode respects for human rights and fundamental freedoms. Do you share those fears? Um, all I can say on that for now is that we take note of the preliminary results of the constitutional referendum that was held on Monday, the 25th of July, as announced by the Electoral Commission in which 30% of the electorate participated. And that is mu as much as I can have on that. And with that, I will turn to our guest. Stay tuned.
Good morning, everybody. We want to thank you all for joining us. Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Gilad Erdan, will deliver brief remarks, and then pending time, we'll take one or two questions. Mr. Ambassador. Good morning, everyone. I must admit that I am deeply frustrated by these monthly debates. These debates here of the Security Council never focus on the biggest threats to the region, namely the nuclearization of Iran, the number one global sponsor of terror. Nor do they ever discuss the true obstacles to peace in our region. Rather, these debates focus on biased reports singling out the most insignificant aspects of a century-old conflict. Sadly, this is precisely why these debates have accomplished nothing, nothing in decades. By putting this Palestinian-Israeli conflict under a super microscope, these debates end up focusing primarily on useless elements such as supposed municipal building violations and small local conflicts. This is, the, this is a debate on the Middle East, home to radical totalitarian regimes, nuclear project, and terror armies. But hey, if you prefer to focus only on the conflict of merely 1% of the region, at least focus removing its biggest obstacles to peace. And let me tell you, despite the same regurgitated false grievances that we hear at every one of these debates, the main obstacle to peace is not and has, not, has never been the Jewish presence in Judea and Samaria. Not only were Palestinians attacking and murdering Israelis long before 1967, no matter how many peace plans, unilateral land withdrawals, far-reaching concessions, or offers to negotiate were placed on the table, the Palestinians always rejected them. The Palestinian rejectionism and hate are the only real obstacles to peace. Yet, shockingly, they are never addressed by this council. They are always forgotten. But it doesn't end with the, only the rejectionism of peace. The Council refuses to address the Palestinian leadership's incitement to terror, financing of terror, payments to terrorists, or their cultivation of a culture of hate. Are these topics not worthy of the Council's focus? Removing these obstacles, or at the very least addressing them, is a productive first step. Yet this council spends these debates analyzing biased reports, singling out only Israel. The thing that really frustrates me, though, is not just that the Palestinian authorities' hate and incitement is never addressed by this council. It is that Hamas, the terror organization that rules Gaza with, a, with an iron fist, seems to not even exist according to the drafters of these reports. This is a terror organization that fires rockets at Israeli civilians while hiding behind its own civilians. This is a terror organization that suppresses the basic human rights of its people. This is a terror organization that kidnapped and tortured Hisham Asayad, a Muslim Israeli suffering from mental health issues. Sickeningly, Hamas has remained silent about Hisham's condition for seven years, but they just released a picture of him looking dazed and hooked up to a ventilator. Look at him. Hisham's father, Hisham's father Shaban, begged, begged to share a message with the council. These are his heartfelt words to the council that I played during my remarks.
خطيرة جدا عبر الصحافة والصحفيين في غزة من المعروف لدى الجميع أنه أبني شعر من ذوي الحياة احتياجات الخاصة حيث أنه يعاني من اضطرابات نفسية وعقلية ونشر مجلس الأمن الدولي التدخل وبذل الجهود الضغط على حماس السكر الفلسطيني كي يضغط صراعه فورا وعدم استعماله كورقة مساومة ضد الدولة في إسرائيل حيث من الواجب احترام القوانين الدولية والمواثيق الدولية التي تحفظ حقوق ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة شكرا لكم Here is a father, a father of a son with special needs, that is begging the Security Council to take action. Hamas is using his boy as a sick bargaining chip, and the world remains silent. The Security Council remains silent. Where is the Security Council's statement condemning Hamas for torturing an Israeli hostage with mental health issues? Hamas is one of the most critical barriers to any advancement between Israelis and Palestinians, yet they are hardly ever a focus of these debates. If these debates aim to accomplish anything, the time has come for them to focus on addressing the real regional threats and discussing the true obstacles to ending the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This is the only way forward. Thank you. Ambassador. Yes. Ambassador, thank you for taking questions. It's Pamela Falk from CBS News. You cited the Iranians for saying that they now are capable of having a nuclear bomb. Does Israel believe that? And what is the alternative that you believe is an alternative to the Iran nuclear deal? Thank you. Well, I, I'm not going to give an assessment whether they can already produce a nuclear bomb or they are closer than ever, but it's quite clear that they continue with their violations, they continue with their race towards the ability, uh, the capability to produce nuclear bombs, and we truly believe that it should be the main concern of this Security Council and we said time and again, and we will continue to say it, that the only way to force the radical Iranian regime to pick between their own survival as a regime and their, own, and their nuclear ambitions is by presenting them with a credible military threat. Otherwise, they will continue with their aggressions, they will continue with their violations, as also was uh, stated uh, by the IEA director, uh, Grossi. All right, and a quick follow-up on the hostages. Are, are there any negotiations to free the, the Israeli citizens held by Hamas? Thank you. I, I, I'm not able to uh, relate to this question, but uh, as I said, it is one of our main focuses, and uh, we call the international community that is, uh, you know, sometimes they are very quickly here in uh, distributing statements uh, about uh, Israel and things that are happening uh, in the Palestinian Authority. But here I uh, show them an example of a human rights issue, and they say nothing. So we hope that uh, the UN, as an organiza organization that formally is committed to uh, Human rights uh, will do something about it. Thank you. We'll take one more question. Okay. Um, uh, Ambassador, you mentioned two years the Middle East has changed dramatically and the Security Council's approach hasn't. So I guess the question is why? Is it because they're afraid to reverse course? Is it that they're guilty about telling the Palestinians something they haven't told them in, in 50 some years? What is it about the Security Council that nothing's changing? Well, I think uh, they should be asked uh, this question. We know what is the right path towards peace. We made peace with uh, four Arab countries in the last two years. Uh, you know, there are so many advancements between uh, Israel and uh, our new Arab partners. And there was also new advancement during uh, President Biden's visit. Uh, to Israel and to Saudi Arabia. We hope to see it continuing. So regarding the Palestinians, definitely, I mean, the, 
the approach of uh, this Security Council is broken because instead of focusing on the real obstacles to peace, like the culture of hate uh, being encouraged by the Palestinian leadership or the fact that there is a terror organization ruling over uh, big parts of the Palestinian Authority preventing them even from holding elections after 17 years. These are the real obstacles that this, this Security Council needs to find ways how to address. But instead, as I elaborated inside, they continue to focus on biased reports, on local uh, disagreements or conflicts taking place in Jerusalem or in Judea and Samaria. But these are not the real obstacles for peace because as I stated inside, before 1967, still the Palestinians never accepted our presence in the region. Ambassador, um, U.S. says the silence from Tehran um, means that Iran is not interested in nuclear deal JCPOA talks. Is there any talks going on between Israeli government and the U.S. on JCPOA talks? We do not intend to analyze the uh, to analyze the behavior of the Iranian regime. We can see with our own eyes the facts. The facts are that they are dragging their feet and not rejoining the deal, and simultaneously continuing with their severe violations of any international commitment that they had. Uh, in the past, and they are closer than ever to uh, acquiring, nu acquiring nuclear capabilities and reaching uranium almost to uh, military grade. And this is a clear threat against the security of not our, only our region, uh, to the whole world. And it needs to be addressed by this Security Council. And this Council is silent. That's all the ambassadors have time for. Thank you so much, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. The 9,103rd meeting of the Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in Libya. The agenda is adopted. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item 2 of the agenda. Members of the Council have before them document S-2022-580, the text of a draft resolution submitted by the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The Council is ready to proceed to the vote on the draft resolution before it. I shall put the draft resolution to the vote now. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2022-580 please raise their hand. Those against? Abstentions? The result of the voting is as follows. 12 votes in favor, no votes against, three abstentions. The draft resolution has been adopted as resolution 2647. I now give the floor to those members of the council who wish to make statements after the vote. I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President. I welcome the adoption of Resolution 2647, renewing UNSMIL's mandate. This resolution contains a number of important messages, including on the political and security processes, integrity of the National Oil Corporation, and human rights. Of particular importance 
is the clear message to the Libyan parties on the need to agree a pathway to deliver presidential and parliamentary elections as soon as possible. We thank council members for their constructive engagement and support for the substantive elements of the resolution. However, we share the frustration of our African colleagues at the short three-month mandate. Their abstention is understandable given Russia's refusal to join consensus on our proposals for a longer mandate for UNSMIL. Russia's approach goes against what Libya, the region and the UN have requested. Insisting on three-month rollovers in the absence of an SRSG is not only short-sighted, but also undermines the ability of UNSMIL to support Libyan leaders to achieve the necessary political and security objectives required to bring stability to the country. President, we welcome the Secretary-General's continued efforts to find a suitable SRSG candidate. It is clear that this is not an easy task, and we call on all relevant stakeholders, including the Council, to take a constructive and flexible approach to enable a swift appointment. Thank you, President. Thank you. Representative of the United Kingdom for her statement. And I'll give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Спасибо, господин председатель. Российская Федерация поддержала подготовленный Великобританией проект резолюции о продлении мандата миссии ООН по поддержке в Ливии. Он стал единственным возможным компромиссом для всех нас на данном этапе. При этом все мы понимаем, что нынешняя конфигурация усилий ООН по посредничеству в этой стране, к сожалению, насущным проблемам ливийского регулирования не отвечает. И нас всех эта ситуация не устраивает. Ненормально, что МОНПОЛ уже в течение длительного времени обезглавлены, что ограничивает имеющийся в ее распоряжении инструментарий по сопровождению ливийского диалога. Пребывание не обладающей соответствующим мандатом СБ спецсоветника генсекретаря Стефани Уильямс на своем посту неоправданно затянулось, несмотря на заверение о том, что ее назначение было временной мерой. Настаиваем на скорейшем внесении Антонио Гутерешем для последующего одобрения членами СБ достойной и авторитетной кандидатуры на пост своего представителя по Ливии и главы МОНПОЛ которая устраивала бы основных ливийских игроков, а также регионалов. В нынешнем документе повторяется четкий сигнал о необходимости безотлагательного принятия решений в этой связи. Надеемся, что нам не придется наблюдать сознательное затягивание данного вопроса в конъюнктурных интересах. Миссии нужен лидер, который бы пользовался истинным доверием ливийцев. Господин председатель, мы не можем согласиться с тем, чтобы ливийское урегулирование строилось вне рамок, задаваемым, задаваемых Советом Безопасности. Это недопустимо, особенно когда в Ливии наблюдается очередной виток двоевластия, и страна подошла к грани, за которой возможно возобновление вооруженного конфликта. Сейчас на кону судьба Ливии и ее народа. Наша настойчивость в вопросе назначения спецпредставителя – продиктована исключительно заботой о поддержании эффективности ООНовской работы по содействию урегулированию в Ливии. Существующая неопределенность этой задачи, к сожалению, не отвечает. Понимаем недовольство этим положением дел наших африканских коллег. Чем дольше оно сохраняется, тем опаснее становится эта ситуация не только для миссии, но и для роли ООН в Ливии в целом. Такое положение дел не стимулирует ливийские стороны к продолжению конструктивной работы, направленной на объединение страны и ее государственных институтов. Господин председатель, мы будем готовы к продлению мандата миссии на стандартный срок 
и более субстантивному наполнению будущей резолюции после того, как МОНПОЛ обретет, наконец, своего руководителя. Рассчитываем на то, что руководство секретариата ООН серьезно воспримет исходящий от Совета сигнал. Благодарю вас. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for his statement, and I give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Said the Rais, to rehab the United Emirates by agreement, قرار تمديد ولاية بعثة الأمم المتحدة للدعم في ليبيا ونسمل ونتقدم بالشكر للمملكة المتحدة بصفتها حاملة القلم على جهودها في تيسير المفاوضات. ونحن على أمل أن يتم التوافق مستقبلا. على تجديد ولاية البعثة لفترة أطول وبالشكل الذي يؤدي إلى تعزيز فعاليتها وكفاءتها ويجعلها قادرة على البناء على التقدم المحرز في العملية السياسية التي يقودها ويملكها الليبيون بمساندة الأمم المتحدة ونؤكد هنا على ضرورة أن تتمكن البعثة من تطبيق توصيات الاستعراض الاستراتيجي المستقل وتنفيذ ولايتها على أكمل وجه وبحيث تستطيع وضع استراتيجياتها على المدى الطويل لدعم الليبيين في جهودهم لتحقيق السلام والاستقرار كما نأمل أن تعود البعثة إلى العمل تحت قيادة ممثل خاص للأمين العام في القريب العاجل وفقا للقرار 2629 وختاما نؤكد على أهمية استمرار هذا المجلس في التحدث بصوت واحد لدعم ليبيا وتحقيق تطلعات الشعب الليبي وشكرا سيد الرئيس I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates for his statement and I give the floor now to the representative of Gabon Merci monsieur le président et je voudrais remercier le Royaume-Uni en tant que porte-plume de cette résolution pour ses efforts, ainsi que les autres membres du Conseil de sécurité pour leur engagement pendant les négociations. Le Gabon s'est abstenu lors du renouvellement du mandat de la Manu. Ce vote est une interpellation pour que les intérêts et les préoccupations des Libyens soient mis au-dessus de toute autre considération. Les membres du Conseil doivent transcender leurs divergences et offrir à la Libye l'appui nécessaire en vue de parvenir à une paix durable. L'inaction du Conseil de sécurité ne fait qu'amplifier les souffrances du peuple libyen. Le Gabon n'avait pas d'autre choix que de s'abstenir. Je tiens à rappeler que l'ambassadeur de Libye nous interpellait très récemment, le 25 juillet 2022, sur l'inefficacité du Conseil à s'entendre sur les moyens de résoudre la crise libyenne et sur les conséquences de cette inaction sur la vie de millions de Libyens qui ne demandent qu'à vivre en paix. Monsieur le Président, le Conseil de sécurité a déjà procédé à quatre renouvellements techniques du mandat de la Manul pour une durée maximum de trois mois, le 15 et le 30 septembre, le 31 janvier et le 29 avril 2022. Alors que tous les voyants sont au rouge et que l'instabilité se renforce en Libye, le Conseil de sécurité demeure sourd. La dégradation progressive de la situation sécuritaire sur le terrain accentue le risque de perdre tous les gains difficilement acquis ces dernières années. Mais le Conseil de demeure insensible. Ces mandats de courte durée entament la crédibilité du Conseil de sécurité et ont profondément brisé la confiance des populations libyennes et des États de la région. Le Gabon rappelle encore une fois que la dégradation de la situation sécuritaire en Libye a un impact visible sur la stabilité de la région, la stabilité des populations africaines. La situation du, Sal du Sahel est là pour nous le prouver. La prolifération d'armes et l'expansion du terrorisme en ont fait une région instable. Monsieur le Président, il est plus que temps de mettre fin à ce cycle de renouvellement de mandats courts qui ne sont pas utiles au peuple libyen. Nous réitérons notre soutien au secrétaire général à la désignation rapide d'un Africain au poste de représentant spécial du secrétaire général. Donnons aux Libyens les moyens de s'entendre, apportons notre appui pour une Libye plus forte par un mandat substantiel de la Manule. Je vous remercie. I thank the representative of Gabon for her statement. 
And I give the floor now to the representative of Ghana. Thank you, Mr. President. Ghana would like to thank the pen holder, that is the United Kingdom, for its diligent and committed efforts in facilitating the negotiation of the resolution just adopted. Regrettably, Ghana abstained from the vote for the following reasons. First, the Council once again and for four consecutive times has failed to show commitment to the Libyan people through technical rollovers and not extending the mandate of Onsmail for a one-year period to consolidate all the gains of the peace efforts and foster serious engagement between the Council and the Libyan people through Onsmail. Two, it may also be noted that the Secretariat, in one of his briefings, drew Council's attention to the fact that short mandates are a disincentive to would-be potential candidates for the position of SRSG. And three, the frustrations of the Libyan people were amply demonstrated by the permanent representative of Libya, Ambassador Taher al -Soni, when he addressed this council on Monday, 23rd June. He demanded action rather than rhetoric from the council. And it is Ghana's firm belief that a substantive mandate renewal would have sent a positive signal to the Libyan people. Four, much as Ghana appreciates the efforts of the Secretary General to fill the vacant position of an SRSG, the failure of the Council to find consensus on his proposed nominee further complicates the Libyan peace process with the departure of the Special Advisor of the Secretary General on Libya. We take this opportunity to call on members of the Council to place the overall interests of Libya above all else and work constructively with the Secretary General in appointing the desired leadership for Onsmail. The people of Libya are crying for elections as a basic step towards the rebuilding of their nation. And this council cannot let them down. In conclusion, we encourage the competent Libyan authorities to make all the necessary efforts in realizing the aspirations of the Libyan people by holding the presidential and parliamentary elections within the mandate cycle. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Ghana for his statement. And I now give the floor to the representative of China. Thank 联立主导团团长兼秘书长特别代表职位已经空缺了半年多时间决议再次要求尽快任命立问题特别代表尽快任命特别代表有助于恢复联立团全面履职增强联合国斡旋能力也有助于为联立团今后获得更长时间的延期
，希望遴选和任命工作，加快取得进展。利比亚利比亚问题延宕十一年多，加强对话，实现和解，有助于为利政治进程营造良好氛围。中方支持决议纳入关于包容、全面的国家和解进程的内容，希望立各方执行建立信任措施，赞赏并支持非盟为立和解进程提供积极支持。谢谢主席先生。I thank the representative of China for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Gracias, presidente. México expresa su apoyo a la labor que realiza la misión de apoyo de las Naciones Unidas en Libia en momentos críticos para la estabilidad política y la seguridad de ese país. Es en ese espíritu que votamos en favor de la resolución para que la misión pueda seguir funcionando ante el marcado deterioro de la situación en Libia. Sin embargo, quiero dejar constancia. de que al limitar nuevamente la extensión del mandato a tres meses estamos contribuyendo a la incertidumbre justo cuando el pueblo libio más necesita la certeza del respaldo de la comunidad internacional a casi un año de recurrir repetidamente a este método las condiciones en las que opera la misión de apoyo de las Naciones Unidas en Libia son cada vez más inciertas por la falta de un mandato sustancial que le permita operar de manera estable. Al mismo tiempo, el puesto de representante especial sigue sigue vacante. A todos convendría romper de una buena vez este círculo paralizante. México reitera la importancia de fortalecer la presencia de las Naciones Unidas en Libia para reencauzar el proceso político. Estamos convencidos que para ello se requiere una misión de apoyo a las Naciones Unidas en Libia reformada, conforme las recomendaciones de la evaluación estratégica realizada el año pasado, y bajo un liderazgo sólido, cabalmente respaldado por el Consejo de Seguridad. Muchas gracias. I thank the representative of Mexico for his statement, and I give the floor now to the representative of Kenya. Uh, Mr. President, on four occasions, the 15th of September last year, the 30th of September uh, last year, the 31st of January, and the 29th of April this year, the Security Council has technically rolled over the mandate of the UN support mission in Libya for not longer than three-month periods. The same has happened today for the fifth time. On each of the four previous occasions, we have expressed our deep disappointment at such brief renewals. Nevertheless, we have voted in the affirmative with the earnest expectation that even in such diminished form, UNSMIL could still provide support to, it, to Libya. What is really required is for the mission to have a substantial mandate for a period of 12 months, plus the appointment of an appropriate African special envoy. Since September last year, this council has been repeatedly briefed on the crippling effects the short mandates have on the ability of UNSMIL to effectively execute its mandate. We have heard this from the Secretariat and from the representative of Libya. As recently as last Monday, Ambassador Taher El Soni lamented the council's inability to find common purpose in its engagement with Libya. He observed the frequency of meetings and the lack of follow-up. And how much our frequent conviction that only Libyan-led and owned solutions will work still require a Security Council that is supportive of progress since the country is under Chapter Seven. This resolution we have voted for, and its three-month mandate for UNSMIL constitutes yet another disappointment to the people of Libya. We appreciate some substantial changes in the resolution. But Kenya believes it is no longer tenable for UNSMIL to operate with such a brief and therefore uncertain mandate. Indeed, the new provisions in the resolution can only be properly implemented with a mandate closer to 12 months. For this reason, we voted to abstain to signal our dissatisfaction with what is fast becoming a damaging status quo. 
We hope that our vote will encourage all council members to reconsider their positions and agree to a longer mandate when the present three-month mandate expires in October. We also hope that a special envoy from Africa will be selected and appointed during this period so that the longer-lasting mandate is implemented properly. Thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for his statement, and I give the floor now to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. And let me thank the United Kingdom for your constructive role as the Unsmel penholder. Thanks to your hard work and the efforts of most of this council, we now have a more substantive mandate that includes important language in support of the political process and assurances that Libya's oil revenue is managed transparently for the benefit of the entire Libyan people. We're pleased to have a substantive mandate for the first time since September 2020, but we're disappointed that once again this council has been forced to accept only a three-month mandate extension. We note our A3 colleagues' abstention today in protest of Russia's insistence on a three-month mandate duration, and we share the A3's frustration. And we believe the A3 clearly have the interests, the best interests, of the Libyan people in mind. Russia's specious contention that a three-month mandate will somehow assist the Secretariat in securing the Council's full support for an SRSG nominee has already been proven false. To the contrary, as the Secretariat has stated numerous times, a short duration only further complicates the Secretariat's efforts. Revisiting the mandate every few months makes it much harder for UNSMIL to implement long-term plans. It makes it harder to develop sustainable solutions to Libya's challenges, and it makes it harder to recruit the best candidate for the role. Libya is at a critical juncture, and UNSMIL has a major role to play in supporting preparations for elections, monitoring the ceasefire, reporting on human rights issues, and providing technical assistance on state finances and budget. The Libyan people are relying on UNSMIL. It does a disservice to them and all of us to play games with the mandate, and the United States will continue its full support of the UN's effort to establish a Libyan-led path to free and fair elections based on a constitutional framework. Finally, I'd like to take this time to thank the Secretary General's Special Advisor to Libya, Stephanie Williams. I want to thank her for her extraordinary efforts to broker an agreement on the constitutional framework for elections. We wish her well in the, her future endeavors and call on the leaders of the House of Representatives and the High State Council to work constructively toward a goal, toward the goal Ms. Williams sought to advance. And we support the efforts of the Secretariat and Council members in their discussions to find a new candidate, someone who can effectively lead UNSMIL and facilitate the necessary dialogue among Libyan leaders toward a persistent peace. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for her statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the representative of Brazil. Brazil welcomes the renewal of the mandate of UNSMIL. We consider it a positive step that the Council acknowledge the importance of peace-building efforts for the future of Libya. Examples of such efforts are institution building, security sector reform, and disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, all of which have been referenced in the resolution adopted today. In that regard, we recall the positive role that the Peace Building Commission can play in assisting countries to implement their peace building priorities, but also in the renewal of mandates of UN missions. As regards the mandate of UNSMIL, the compromise reached within the Council on its duration offers the Secretary-General 
and council members renewed opportunity to engage towards the appointment of the mission's leadership with the expectation that a suitable candidate, candidate will be appointed as soon as possible. We hope that the subsequent renewals of Unsmill mandate will benefit from time frames that are more predictable. Finally, because regional dynamics should be taken into account, we believe that a candidate from the African continent would be well suited for the position. I now resume my function as President of the Council. There are no more speakers inscribed on the list. The meeting is adjourned. Okay, a little bit more about what uh, UNSMIL is, and that is spelled U N S M. I L, and it is a um, let's simply put it, the United Nations Support Mission for Libya. It is integrated in special political mi mission established on um, se 16 September 2011 by the UN Security Council resolution. 2009 um, and 2011 at the request of the Libyan authorities to support the country's new transition authorities in their post-conflict efforts. UNSMIL mandate was modified and extended by the UN Security Council resolutions in 20. 22, um, 2040, and 2095, which extended the UNSMIL um, mission as integrated by special polit political mission until 15 September tw 2021. Um, all UN activities in Libya are guided by the principle of a national ownership. The mission under the leadership of the special re represent representative of the S Secretary General, supported by the deputy, is overseen by the United Nations Department of Political Affairs, which provides guidance and operational assistance. UNSMIL has sub, uh, substantive staff in political affairs, human rights, transitional justice, mine action, demobilization development, women empowerment, public information and communications, as well as support staff. Unanimously adopted Resolution 2023 in December 2016 by the Security Council mandated UNSMIL in full accordance with the principles and national ownership to exercise mediation and good offices in support of the Libyan political agreements implementation, the consolidation and governance, security, economic arrangements of the government of national accord subsequent phases of the Libyan transition process. Which leads us to what we just heard today on the UN Security Council floor where they have a three month extension to UNSMIL and the member from the, the Russian Federation um, saying that he doesn't want to go past, or the Russia does not want to go past the three months until there is a permanent person held accountable for UNSMIL, um, is seemingly holding things, holding progress behind for the directives that 
um, the UN Security Council wants UNSMIL to undertake and to proceed with. Um, the people of Libya are, need a stable government. They need a, a stable place to live so that things happen for them. Development and uh, health care and human rights and all those things that, that we hold dear to us it needs to be put into their government. Elections and things instead of dictatorships need to be put in place. And that is what UNSMIL is supposed to be doing. And a only the three months extensions as, as they're being handed to them could be tying their hands behind their back from them being able to achieve long-term goals for the country of Libya. So, thank you for listening today, and um, wherever you can, go out and vote. Try to try to have an effect on your community and voice opinions on those issues that truly affect us. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.